Thank you so much. Isn't God good? Come on. I'm so excited. Such a privilege and an honor to be here with you guys on a Sunday morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Book of Proverbs chapter 15. The book of Proverbs chapter 15. We're going to start with verse 14. You know what's interesting? So I can kind of just give you my process. I know a lot of different preachers and uh, teachers, different ones have different processes. One of my processes when God is speaking to me about certain things within Scripture is I, I love to read different translations. And so I'll, I'll always start off, you know, I'll read the NIV, New International Version. I'll read the New Living Translation. I'll read the New King James. I'll even go old school and read some King James just to practice my old English. And, uh, and so here I'm, 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 reading, I'm reading this passage in Proverbs 15, 14, and it stands out to me. And I, I want us to read this. This is the New International Version. Proverbs 15, 14. The discerning heart seeks knowledge but the mouth of a fool feeds on folly so all of a sudden i'm reading through these different versions and i come to the message bible and i want us to look at what the message bible says in proverbs 15 14 an intelligent person is always eager to take in more truth Fools feed on fast food, fads, and fancies. Fools feed on fast food, fads, and fancies. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you open our ears to hear. Holy Spirit, we are in desperate need of you. Holy Spirit, we ask for you to come in this moment. Breathe on us. For, Lord, it is the work of your Spirit that breaks every yoke of bondage. It is the work of your Spirit that brings forth life and strength and power. So, Holy Spirit, come, make the Word alive to us, that we're not simply hear, simply hearers of the Word and so deceive ourselves, but doers also. And I pray that now in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen and amen. You may be seated. The title of my message this morning, if you're taking notes, don't be fooled by fast food fads and fancies. The title of my message is don't be fooled by fast food fads and fancies. Uh, stores are, are very strategic. And I remember growing up as a kid, we would be spending all this time in the store and, and um, we'd be in the different aisles and we'd be going with my mom. I think there was a point where my mom was just like, I'm done taking you to the grocery store because I don't want to fight. And, um, but one of the things that stores have this strategy, if you'll notice, all the candies and all the sodas and all that are right by the cash register. Right? And I, so what happened is there was a situation, I was grocery shopping the other day, and this was just yesterday. And I was reminded, all of a sudden, I went back in time. And I was reminded of when I was a kid and we'd go to the cash register to check out, and all of a sudden I'd be like, oh, candy, I want, anybody here, like Reese's peanut butter cups is your jam. Anybody, amen. You are anointed of God. He loves you more than anybody else. No, just saying, just saying. But anyways, I like Reese's Pieces and I like Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. I was just, that was my jam. And I would always, and it was one, some, sometimes it was like I'd grab the candy, just kind of toss it up on the counter, you know, and my mom would be like, how did this get here? And, and so, but we were at the store the other day and my daughter was just like, here, daddy, here's some Skittles. And it just, it reminded, and like, I didn't even, I didn't even know. All I hear is this on the counter and there's these Skittles going down. I'm like, well, uh, 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 uh. oh. A lady already rung it up. I'm looking at my daughter going, what is this? And I realized something. The devil has the same strategy. Now just hear me for a second. How many of you here are convinced that God's got a call in your life? Come on, how many of you are convinced that there is a standard of living, a lifestyle of living, a conviction that God has given us so that we can walk in the fullness of what he's called us to? How many of you are convinced that God has an anointing for your life? Come on, somebody. Let me tell you what the devil wants to do. 
In the same way, he wants to present things that are tantalizing, things to try and get your attention and distract you and try and get your desire. To try and get you to step away from and become distracted of your calling and your convictions and your anointing. What's interesting about this passage that we find here in Proverbs 15, verse 14, it's evident, it's evident through a multiplicity of scriptures that Solomon is equating the pursuit of knowledge, and I want you to hear this, the pursuit of knowledge and revelation of truth to that which is substantiated in the reality of God. What does that mean, Pastor? Knowledge and understanding come from God. God is the creator and the purveyor of all wisdom. It doesn't just come by knowing more books and reading more books. Now, we can gain understanding that's wonderful. But true knowledge and wisdom is derived from our relationship and our knowing of God. He is the source of truth and wisdom. And this is what Solomon is saying. So when we ask, well, Solomon, what does it mean to know God, to have that knowledge of God? It means to be convinced of God's nature and character. See, we have a propensity, and I want you to hear this, we have a propensity or a tendency to make God into our image. (laughs) In our attempts to better know God, we create an idea of God, making it much more palatable for our interaction with him. But we have to understand something. We serve a God that is not made in our image. We are made in his. As a matter of fact, many theologians and many philosophers, many historians call God, Jehovah God, the godless or imageless God. Because he's the only God in all creation that never required an image of himself. Every other God that has ever been worshiped, people always, the first thing they did was they create an image of that God. Yet he was the imageless God. Can I tell you why I believe that is? Is because God wanted to always keep us and the understanding of us being made in his image that we worship him. We are not the ones to be worshiped. We're created for his glory. We're created for his glory. So we see clearly in this passage something that is very needed. What Solomon is saying is a requirement and what is necessary in our life is to reestablish the value of the call of God, godly biblical convictions, and the anointing. And these really are only established in our knowing of God. They're not apart from God. Our purpose, our convictions, and the anointing in our life is found only in Christ. So this is the challenge. I think this is the challenge that most of us face. It becomes easy to give up on something that does not hold great value in our lives. Value determines pursuit. Value determines receptivity. Value determines the lifestyle you choose to live. If you value something, it's easy to receive. Isn't it interesting on how, if if you devalue someone, everything that comes from them, no matter how valuable what what they give you, no matter how valuable what they give you is, because it came from them, it's automatically devalued in your mind. Think about that. So what we value or what we devalue will determine what we pursue, what we receive from, and the lifestyle we choose to live. Proverbs 15, 14 has so much to do with what we value. The wise value knowing God. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom, Solomon says. <laughs> the wise value knowing God. The fool values fast food, fads, and fancies. So the question I give to you this morning is how do we not be fooled? In 2023, how do we not be fooled by fast food, fads, and fancies? I want us to look at this because we see very clearly what scripture is trying to help us understand. Number one, fast food, everybody say fast food. Anybody here like fast food? Like, let's just be real. Anybody here a fast food fanatic? Like, come on, come on. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. You're wonderful. Amen. But let's be real on this, though. How many of you have had fast food and then you're driving home? Like, you're eating the fast food in your car because it's convenient. That's one of the main reasons is you don't want to have to go home. You don't want to have to wait. You want it right now. So you go through a fast food place. There's one fast food place in particular that it always has this reputation. It's everyone I've ever talked to, it has this reputation. Man, I spent like 30 bucks at this place and the moment I got home after eating, I was still hungry. Right? Fast food. Hmm. Fast food is defined as cheap, Instant, unsatisfying, and inadequate. Because it actually doesn't have the nutritional components to truly fill you up and satisfy you. It's void of certain nutritional components to help your body feel satiated. It's interesting. So what is Solomon talking about? What is Solomon referring to of these things that we get fooled by? Fast food. Cheap, instant, unsatisfying, inadequate components in our life. What are we feeding on? What are we choosing to feed on? Genesis chapter 25. A very interesting story. Many of you know this story. There's a man who had been hunting all day. Many theologians believe that he had been gone numbers of days hunting and hunting and he was so famished that he came and saw his brother cooking a bowl of stew. And he was so hungry, he actually thought, he perceived that he was gonna die and so he was willing to give up anything just for a morsel of food. It was there, it was fast, it was convenient, it was easy. And he said to his brother Jacob, Esau says to his brother Jacob, he says, I will give you my birthright for this stew. What's interesting about this passage is many times we look at Esau as saying that he gave up his birthright, meaning he gave up his inheritance. But the honest truth is I don't necessarily believe or perceive that that's what Esau thought he was giving up. I think probably in the recesses of Esau's mind, he probably thought, well, you know what? My brother, my brother won't be true to this. It's my inheritance. I'm the first son. My dad will never give him the inheritance. And also, if he wants to steal it from me, I'll just beat him up anyways. I'm the stronger, hairier son anyways. But this is what we do know. The problem was Esau saw it as an inheritance instead of a blessing. The blessing lost its value. See, Jacob, the reason why the birthright was so important, it wasn't just an inheritance, it was a blessing. It was spiritual. It was supernatural. That's why he longed for it. He understood the magnitude of the blessing. That blessing lost its value. This is the value issue. What do you value? Do you value the blessing of God? Do you value the call of God on your life? Where do we find satisfaction and fulfillment it's a very interesting parallel that we see here in scripture john chapter 4 verse 34 
Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. This is something that's interesting. Let me tell you what happened. Kind of the, let me preface this, this passage with this, this story. What's happening is Jesus is basically gone of a considerable amount of time with food. He's starving. He's hungry, borderline emaciated, and his disciples can tell, and his disciples are actually concerned about Jesus. And Jesus just got done spending all this time with the woman at the well, pouring in and blessing and, and ministering. And, and his disciples come and say, Jesus, what's going on with you? They even, some, some theologians actually believe that the disciples were mocking Jesus because he refused to eat. Jesus, what's wrong with you? What are you doing? And Jesus says these profound words. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The antithesis of Esau. Are you seeing this? The very opposite of Esau. Here's this same hunger, and yet Jesus was valued his call and his destiny and his purpose over his hunger. How many times have I given up my call because I had a desire and a hunger for something else? We continue to eat that and consume that which cannot satisfy. Can I, can I give you this statement? I want you to write this down. Sin never satisfies. Sin is incapable of satisfying. As a matter of fact, is when we operate in sin, it's just like, oh man, it, it just cultivates even more of a hunger for sin. We can never be satiated, never be satisfied. Proverbs 13, 25, this, this is crazy. The revelation that Solomon gives us, he says, an appetite for good brings much satisfaction. An appetite for good brings much satisfaction. But the belly of the wicked always wants more. Never satisfied. Sin is never, oh, well, Pastor, if I, just, if I just do this one thing this one last time, then it's, no, 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 no. Sin is never satisfied. And that's why we have to pursue righteousness. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. They shall be satisfied. Come on, somebody. And I've got good news for you. You ready for this? Sin is never satisfied, but i got good news. Jesus satisfies you. Come on. The word of God, sat come on, you can do better than that. The word of God satisfies you. The Holy Spirit satisfies you. It's Psalms 107, verse 9. Oh, if you write this passage down, stick it on your refrigerator, it'll be easier to fast. Are you ready for this? For he satisfies, Psalms 107, 9. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Whew. With goodness. That's what God desires to fill you with. God desires to fill you with the goodness of his abundance, of his glory, of his presence, his word, his promises. Man, I don't know about you, but that makes me excited. Why? Because I know that in my life, as long as I'm feeding from the word of God, as long as I'm feeding in the presence of God, then I will be satisfied. Can I tell you, nothing can satisfy you like Jesus. Nothing can satisfy you like the presence of the Lord. If I say fast food. But the second thing is Solomon puts an emphasis on fads. Fads. The definition of fads is temporary hype and excitement. The flash in the pan. The relentless pursuit of what's popular. How about this one? Are you ready for this one? External pressure resulting in internal compliance. Oh, I like that. So much external pressure that it results in an internal compliance on our part. Okay, fine, I'll buy your product. 
Okay, you're right. I just got the, the iPhone 13, but I have to have the 14. I'm incomplete if I don't have the 14 and a half. What are we bowing to? The certain convictions in which the word of God has established in our life, what are we bowing to? As Christians, as believers, we have a tendency to move from one adrenaline rush to another adrenaline rush, to the one, one thing to the next best thing, and we find our significance in the next best thing. Now, listen, I'm not telling you, I'm not saying that it's not good to have good things and nice things. I've got nice things. i got the iPhone 14. 13, sorry, 13. 13, my wife was 13. Sorry, I thought I was cooler than that, but I'm obviously... <laughs> Not cool enough. I, look, I'm, I'm not saying that it's bad to have good things and nice things. But what are we valuing? Do we put greater value on fads? I, I want you to look at this. There's, there's, there's two really interesting stories in the Bible. There's a young man named Demas. Demas was a disciple of Paul the Apostle. Demas traveled with Paul the Apostle. Demas saw incredible miracles and breakthrough. I mean, he saw revelations. He saw supernatural spiritual things. Demas was in prison with Paul. And yet somewhere along the road, something happened. As a matter of fact, Paul the Apostle was a little oblivious to it because it was such a surprise to him that he writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at this passage, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. He writes, I need you to send help right away. Please, send help right away. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this, prison, this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Demas forsook me, having loved this present world. Something happened. Something caught his attention and his desire. What happened? But you know, a lot of us, we can look at a Demas and go, Oh, Demas, I can't believe he'd do that. That's right. That's just Demas. You know, we, and we, we hound on Demas. But can I, can I just tell you right now, that there's a hero of the Bible that really struggled in his life with fads. And as a matter of fact, it was his hypocrisy that caused a massive discrepancy within a certain place within Scripture. And the church in Antioch was affected by it. And I want you to see this in Galatians 2.11. Look at this. Galatians 2.11. Paul the Apostle addresses a situation that took place. And what had happened is Peter, who is this incredible man of God, a disciple of Jesus, he was the one that Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter, it was said of Peter that he would rise and he become the revivalist in the book of Acts, that on the day of Pentecost, Peter in that moment would be the fundamental part of starting the revival that would happen. Wow, this is Peter the leader of the pack. And one day, Peter has this incredible revelation. Peter was minding his own business, and all of a sudden, this is amazing, all of a sudden, he gets a dream. The Bible says that he was taken up, and God gave him a dream, and it was three separate dreams, three separate revelations. And it was basically God telling Peter showing him all these things that were considered defiled foods that, uh, that Israelis or Jews could not eat. And God spoke to Peter and said, do not call this unclean that I have made clean. And for Peter, are you ready for this? For Peter, that was a call to the Gentiles. From that time, at that time, Peter had been, his, his ministry was isolated only to the Jews. But he received a call from God now to minister through this revelation to minister to Gentiles. I don't know about you, but if God gave me a revelation like that, that would be amazing. 
And then right after that, God opens the door for him to minister to a Gentile named Cornelius, and the power of God is poured out upon him. He receives the Holy Spirit as a sign of confirmation what the Lord is doing, and it, listen, it radically changes the effectiveness of Peter's ministry. But then all of a sudden, something happens. Paul the apostle catches wind of something that took place. And he confronts Peter in Galatians chapter 2, 11. Are you ready for this? Listen to this. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed for before certain men came from James, he would eat with Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrisy with him. So that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Here's Peter playing the hypocrite because in one moment, hear me, he gets a revelation from God but then he falls under the pressure of the crowd. This is Peter. This is Peter who got up before 3,000 men and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, which was unpopular, somebody that just been crucified. But yet he falls under the pressure, these external pressures that he makes an internal decision to walk in hypocrisy. Why? Why is it so important? Why would Peter fall victim to this? Friends, how many of us have done the same thing? For one way in front of one group of people and another way in front of a whole different group of people. We live one way on Saturday and another way on Sunday. Come on, people. Anybody with me? We change our position our calling and our theology based upon our surroundings. But God has called us to be faithful, steadfast, and immovable. We see Daniel chapter 3. Oh, this is amazing. Again, the antithesis of this very moment. Well, here's in Daniel chapter 3, three Hebrew children that are commanded to bow before an idol. And the Bible says they would not bow. Everybody else was bowing. Why don't you just bow down before this altar? We won't bow before this idol. Well, we're gonna throw you into a fiery furnace. You better bow. We will not bow before this idol. And they threw him into the fire. And within the fire, the Bible says arose a fourth man that looked, oh, I love it, looked like the Son of God. Come on, somebody. Some of us want breakthrough. Some of us want victory. Some of us want miracles. But we keep bowing to idols. And God is saying, don't bow. Stand firm. Don't walk in hypocrisy. Stand firm and watch the miracles. Watch the victory. Watch the breakthrough that I will produce in your life. Everybody say fads. Fast food fads. And my last point this morning, fancies. The definition of fancies is the tantalizing, shiny, that which captures our attention becoming the object of our desire. We see very clearly that every one of us has been given a call. Friends, can I tell you, if we could get a glimpse, a revelation of the call of God that he has in your life, it would astonish you. But we also are called to a lifestyle. We're called to have certain convictions. And friends, just to be honest with you, there's a wrestling that takes place of convictions in our life. What part of my desire do I listen to? What part of the word of God do I pick and choose out of or do I obey the word of God? Do I have to confront the hypocrisy in my life? Can, can, I want everybody to just look at me, just real quick, please. 
I've only got a few minutes left in the sermon. Every one of us, every, if Peter, if Peter had to confront hypocrisy in our life, every one of us is going to have to confront hypocrisy in our lives, myself included. I've even had Dr. James Morocco, the global senior pastor of King's Cathedral and chapels worldwide, come up to his son and say these words, son, I am so sorry I did this wrong. I acted wrong. That was hypocr hypocritical of me. I'm so, oh, I can't believe it. It's something we're all going to have to confront. We're all going to have to face. Will we succumb? Will we succumb to the fads of this world? But friends, will we give in to the fancies? One of the most tragic, one of the most tragic stories in all of Scripture. We see here in 2 Kings chapter 5. The book of 2 Kings chapter 5. It tells us of one of the most tragic stories that exists within the Bible. And it leads up, the story leading up to 2 Corinthians 5 really is of a man named Elijah. Now, Elijah was a prophet called by God that called fire down from heaven and won a great battle against the prophets of Baal. God used him to perform incredible miracles. God used him to defeat armies. God used him to establish his covenant. It was amazing. God used Elijah in such a profound way. And then all of a sudden, God calls a man named Elisha to serve Elijah. And the Bible explains to us that Elisha served and would not leave Elijah's side. And when the time came, Elisha received a double portion anointing from Elijah. And then we see later on in Elisha's life these profound miracles that God would perform by the hands of Elisha. Elisha definitely received a second portion, a double portion anointing of Elijah. Wow. But now here we see in 2 Kings 5, Elisha and his servant Gehazi. Now, Gehazi had seen many miracles, profound, profound miracles, things that the, the supernatural really is the only way you could explain the happenings that went on. And he arrived at this moment where there was this man named Naaman, who was an officer, and he had leprosy. And he comes to El Elisha to to ask for help and Elisha says look I want you to go dip in the Jordan and many of us know the story Naaman he dipped and dipped and dipped and dipped and dipped and God healed him of his leprosy wow so what's amazing is Naaman in his appreciation comes to Elisha and says I want to bless you is there any way that what comes through Elisha through Gehazi says I want to bless your master is there any way that I can bless you and Elisha's response is no we're not going to receive anything from him because we want God to get all the glory now this is just me this is just this is just this is just me this is the way my brain thinks so just bear with me for a second I can just imagine that moment where Elisha tells Gehazi, it ain't happening, we're not going to receive anything. And Gehazi's like, seriously, man? Because I could use some new pants. Like, do you see the holes that are in my pants? Like a little bit of silver ain't no problem, Elisha. What's wrong with you? And Elisha's like, no, go tell him thank you, but no thank you. And I could just see Gehazi. Stupid rocks. I know none of you have ever done that when your authority said, don't, no. When your mom and dad said, no, you can't have it. Pouting the whole way there. And there's Naaman. And instead of Gehazi obeying Elisha so that God would receive all the glory, Gehazi says, ah, it's just a little bit of silver and it's some clothes. And you know the saddest part about the story, to me, why it's one of the most tragic stories in the Bible, 
is here's a man who was positioned to receive an anointing from someone who had a double portion anointing from Elijah. He was positioned to receive that anointing, but he gave up the anointing for silver and clothes. For fancies. How many times in my life have I become distracted and sidetracked with other things? I have to have this, I need this. And those things became the desire and the motivation of my life. And the worst part was I wasn't just disobeying God, I was robbing glory from God. Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Fast food, fads, and fancies. Friends, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. In 2023, don't be fooled by fast food, fads, and fancies. Don't give up your call. Don't give up your convictions. Don't give up your anointing for anything. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. The silver and the clothes aren't worth it. So how do we not get fooled by fast food fads and fancies? And as I close this message and I'll ask the worship team to come, Paul gives us, are you ready for this? Paul gives us simply, simply, I'm just gonna give you two things real quick. How many of you say, Pastor, I don't wanna be fooled by fast food fads and fancies in 2023? I wanna give you two keys, you ready? Paul the apostle gives us two keys on how not to be fooled by fast food fads and fancies. Number one, Paul says the secret is contentment. In Philippians 4.11, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content, to be what? Content in everything. I've, I know what it is to have, I know what it is not to have. I, I've had so much and then there's moments where I've had nothing, but I've learned contentment is a key because the role of contentment is to keep your eyes on what's most important. You know what contentment is? Contentment is being thankful to God Lord that I know I can trust you I can trust that you're working things out I can trust Lord I'm so thankful that you have me in this season I was sharing with the first service when I was in Oahu somebody we, 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 we didn't have a car and someone had given me a two door Honda Civic and I thank I thank God for that two door Honda Civic man because it got me from place to place but it was boss up like the door the, the driver's side door barely open right and even one time i was on kalani on ole highway and i was at a light and my car died and i thank god it was stick shift because i just opened the door and stuck my foot out the the door and i started pedaling like that i, I looked like the flintstones i'm telling you i was pedaling like that and i got my car jumped up and i was like and i took off and i even remember moments was like oh god please i need a car that doesn't make you look god my car makes you look bad But you see, God wanted to teach me contentment. See, because this is the thing we have to understand. God will supply. The Bible says, my God shall supply all my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Do you know what that means? That God will supply to you everything that you need for your call. If he calls you to something, he will supply every need that you have to accomplish that call. You know, it's amazing. God began to bless me. So much so 
that there's times where I, I got to be honest, sometimes I'm a little embarrassed because God blessed me so much. Like I have to explain the car that I drive. People look at my car, we pass so you drive a Land Rover? Oh, see, like some of you are offended that I just said Land Rover just then. You're like, oh, he drives a Land Rover, but you don't know the story. I didn't go looking for the Land Rover. The Land Rover looked for me. I got my wife. We had a we had a very <clears throat> tight budget, very tight budget, and so I had a Passat. And, and finally, I was just like, I'm done with Passats because every time I went to pick up my dad at the airport, he'd get in the car and we'd actually have to turn sideways in order to drive. I was like driving like this and my dad one day looks at me and goes, son, this doesn't work. So I remember telling my wife, I was paying $225 a month for my Passat. So one day I told my wife, I said, babe, we need to believe in faith. I need a new car, babe. And I need a car where both my dad and I can fit in it. Right? So she says, okay, babe, you're paying 225 right now. I'll tell you what. We'll move some things around in our budget. And I think we may be able to afford a car for $275 a month. Excuse me? That was my response. Like, excuse me? You know what ends up happening is I, I start looking. I, I look, I look, I look, I look, I look. I'm being very diligent. I'm just looking everywhere. And because I was such a valued uh, what is that? A valued member or whatever it might be of, of Volkswagen. They said, you know what? We'll cut you a deal. We'll give you a Volkswagen. Uh, what was the name of the thing? Tiguan, right? For like $375. But you'd have to put this much money down. I'm like, I don't have that much money to put down. And you'd have to do this and do I'm like, ah. I was complaining to my wife, baby, we got to move some other things around. I even told, I even threatened, babe, babe, I'll fast to save some money. <laughs> Have you seen my kids? There's nobody else in my family that eats. I'm the only person that eats in my house. <laughs> Make a long story short. I'm about to pull the trigger. My wife finally said, okay, 375. We'll just have to believe in faith. We'll do this thing. And uh, I'm about to go to Volkswagen. I get a phone call from a guy in the church that says, Pastor, whatever you do, don't buy that car yet until you stop by my dealership. I said, I'm not coming to your dealership because you, do a, you have a Land Rover and whatever dealership. I ain't doing that. There's not one car in your fleet that I can buy. He says, Pastor, just come by. Just have fun with it. Let's go for a drive. And it was the worst drive of my life because I'm sitting in that car driving this thing going, this is so nice, one of these days. And he looks at me as we're driving the car. He said, Pastor, every organization gives their employees these pins. It's a promotional thing so that, so that the employees would, would drive the vehicles. He said, Pastor, I want to give you my pin. I said, excuse me? He says, I want to give you my pin. I didn't know, I couldn't understand really the magnitude of that. So I'm thinking through it, I'm going through the paperwork, I'm trying to figure it out, and I get a phone call as we're trying to go through this something. I get a phone call from somebody from the mainland, and it would, it's gonna require a hefty down payment. I get a phone call from a couple in the mainland that said, hey pastor, we just wanna let you know, we sent out a check, it should be arriving. God spoke to us and says that we're supposed to send you some money for a down payment for your car. They had no idea that I was even looking for a car. Okay. Two days later, I receive in the mail a check for $5,000. Okay. So I told the guy, I said, so let me ask you this question. If I put $5,000 down and with this pin and everything, how much would my monthly payments for this car be? He says, $375. Same as the Tiguan. I was like, okay. And then all of a sudden, are you ready for this? Friends, can I tell you, when you're not looking for it, when you're not looking for it, God has the ability for it to look for you. I'm still contemplating, what do I do? And I get a phone call from a person in the church. It says, Pastor, the Holy Spirit spoke to us and said that we're to give you $100 a month for the life of your lease of this car. And I was like, I called my wife and said, babe, 
I got the car for $275. Friends, God knows how to do miracles. But what are you chasing after? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Friends, the problem is that we don't, when we don't understand contentment, we're constantly trying to find our joy and our completion and our fulfillment in other things that can't satisfy. But the second key is Paul says, my greatest pursuit is Jesus. Philippians 3.10 that I may know him. Are you ready for this? Listen, what, what do we start off this sermon with? We got to know God. It's all about knowing him. Philippians 3.10, Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. To know him, to walk in intimacy with God. Friends, how do we live a life where we don't get fooled by fast food fads? And fancies how do we do it we learn what it is to trust God to be content in every moment of our life to say Lord I know you're working it out Lord I'm what's most important to me is my relationship with you I don't measure my life by what I have or what I don't have I measure the significance of my life in my relationship with you and I'm gonna pursue you I'm going to pursue you. Then we will find ourselves in 2023 not falling victim to fast food, fads, and fancies. How many of you will say, Pastor, this year in 2023, I want to take the challenge. 2023, I refuse to be fooled by fast food, fads, and fancies. Pastor, I want to I wanna walk in a greater relationship with the Lord. I don't want to be sidetracked. I don't want to be... I don't want to be one who falls victim to this anymore, Pastor. You know, I truly believe this, and this is for someone. I didn't even say this in the first service. True wisdom comes from what you're pursuing. And a lot of times we give in to foolishness because of certain desires in our life. But if we'll desire God, he will establish in our life true wisdom, which will produce fruit in your life like you've never seen before. How many of you say, Pastor, I'm going to make that commitment. I'm going to apply these two keys to my life, contentment and pursuing God. If you say that, come on, if you say that, I just want you to lift your hands right where you are. Come on, all over this house. Lift your hands to the Lord. I want you to just remain seated with your hands lifted to the Lord. Come on, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Maybe some of you have been like me. You fall, you have fallen prey to the lies of the enemy. You've gotten distracted before. Come on, I've gotten distracted before. There's been seasons in my life where I've given up the call, I've given up convictions, I've given up the anointing for certain tantalizing things, and I'm sick and tired of falling victim. I'm sick and tired of becoming a fool of the enemy. I'm gonna walk in the fullness of what God has for me. So Lord, as we lift our hands right now, I pray an anointing upon your people. I pray your hand to come upon them, your power to be released upon them. Lord, I rebuke fear. I rebuke every motive of the enemy, every desire that the enemy has been trying to fill their minds and their hearts with. Lord, every lie of the enemy, I break it off them now in Jesus' name. We take authority over it now. And I declare, Lord, wisdom to come. Holy Spirit, let, wis let wisdom come in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, I want us just to right where you are. I want you to just worship the Lord. Come on, lift your voice just for a moment. Jesus, I'm desperate. Yes, Lord God. For you. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I'm hungry. Oh, Lord, I'm hungry for you. For you. Oh, Jesus, I'm longing for you. Because, Lord. Jesus! 
Maybe you're here this morning. You say, Pastor, I've never received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, Jesus, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, Jesus became the gift The Bible says he became the propitiation. That means he took your place on the cross. The punishment that was yours because of sin, Jesus put upon himself so that we could be forgiven and we could be reconciled unto God. So that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. And this morning, here in this place, is the free gift of salvation that is available to you who believe. And if you're here, you say, Pastor, I know there's sin in my life that I need to be forgiven of, and I'm tired of carrying the weight and the burden of condemnation and guilt and shame. I want my sins to be forgiven. Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to walk in a relationship with him. Pastor, will you pray for me? If that's you on the count of three, I want you to lift your hands. Ready? One, two, three. All over this house. Come on, if that's you. If that's you, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. Awesome, awesome. Come on, let's give it up for these right now. Will you just, will you just give it up for them? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to invite you to say this prayer with me. Are you ready? The Bible gives us two promises. The promise of salvation by confessing him as Lord and Savior, but also the promise of forgiveness. That if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just, will forgive you your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Will you say this prayer with me? Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. Give me a new mind and a new heart. Put a desire for you in me. Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I believe you are the risen Lord and I surrender my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we just rejoice one more time for what God is doing? Hey, if you said that prayer for the very first time or maybe you recommitted your life to the Lord, can I invite you to stop back at the Next Steps booth? But I'm going to ask everyone real quick. i got to do this because i got to be obedient to my global senior pastor. I want to ask everyone to have a seat real quick. And we haven't done something like this in a long time. But I want to give everybody an opportunity to do something very significant. Now, look, you're not forced uh, to do this. If you feel compelled by the Holy Spirit to participate in this, praise God for you. Everybody say February 26th. In February t- Sunday, February 26th, we're doing something very significant. Now, in 2022, we did something called honor services. We honored um, our first responders. We honored educators, teachers, and professors. And we honored even uh, our military mothers and fathers, the whole thing. But in 2023, we're going to do something that we felt like the Holy Spirit led us into. We're going to honor a very valued, very special group of people. And that's our kupuna. That's our widows and widowers and also orphans. You know, the book of James chapter 1 tells us that pure religion, that religion which is pure, is to bless, to take care of widows and orphans. And what we're going to be doing in February 26th, we're going to be blessing all of our kupuna. That means everyone 65 and older. Sorry, 64-year-olds, we love you. We're going to be blessing them with a gift because we just, it's, it's a gift that expresses our love and how much we value you. Secondly, all those, no matter what age you are, if you're a widow or widower, we're going to be blessing you and, and just wanting to value you as well. But there's also a ministry, Harvest Family, that we're going to be pouring into. Harvest Family right now is one of the premier um, organizations within Hawaii that have been finding Christian homes for foster kids around the state. And we felt like right now, if there's any ministry that we want to pour into, it's going to be that ministry in this season because God wants us to take care of those people. And so we're going to be blessing on February 26th. We're going to be blessing those people. Now, let me tell you, it's going to cost over $15,000 to do this. You're saying, and some of you are looking at me right now going, Pastor, we're going to give away $15,000. Absolutely. 
because we so value and so love these people. We want to do everything we can to show that and to express God's heart for them. Amen. And so we're just going to give you an opportunity. And from now to February 26th, if the Holy Spirit speaks to you to be a part of this, go ahead and just give in the offering. You can just mark it, just mark it, honor service. And, uh, but we're going to give people an opportunity to be a part of this, this Sunday. And, uh, throughout the month, we'll give you opportunities to do that. But how many of you guys think this is going to be a good thing? Hey, guess what though? This is, this is actually what I really like about this too, is for all the kupuna who come, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be setting up a professional photo booth for them and giving them professional family photos. What are, what are they called? They're, uh, portraits, family portraits, and uh, we're going to be sending it to, and it's going to be professionally done, and so our hope is the, the, the kupuna of our church will invite their family and be like, hey, come do a family portrait with me, and we'll be able to preach the gospel to them. How many of you guys think that'll be awesome? And then just bless them in that way as well, so so cool. I love this church. Don't you love our church? Doing wonderful things for people. It's wonderful. All right. Everybody has an envelope that needs one. If you're writing out a check, write your checks out to KC or King's Cathedral. Again, this is just an opportunity for you. No one's forced here to do it. But and if you want to give uh, online or electronically, you can just follow our um, intuitive prompts there on the screen. Hey, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this wonderful opportunity you've given us as a, as a church to express value and love toward a group of people. Lord, that you have instructed us as a church to love deeply. And so I pray, Father, for the $15,000 plus to come in so that we can do our best to bless your people. And we pray it now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Let's give. Come on, let's stand to our feet and let's worship. We sing, come like a flood. Come like a flood. Say this, lift your hands to the Lord. You ready? This is a challenge. Everybody say this with me. This week, I refuse to be fooled by fast food, fads, and fancies. Lift your hands to the Lord. Father, I pray a blessing over your people. Lord, that this week they will know what it is to seek after you, to be content in all that they have in their life and all that you're doing, Lord, because they know that all they have comes from you, that you will be glorified in their lives, that you would be magnified in their lives, that you would do a wonderful, amazing work in them and through them. I declare that you bless them indeed. Expand their territory. Let your hand be upon them. Lord, I declare divine appointments, and let's say it together, crazy, crazy favor in Jesus' name. And everybody said. Amen and amen. God bless you. We love you.